Hi everyone, today we're going to learn about how to do our PNS wave calculations from our Earth Science Reference Table, ESRT. Um, and first we'll start with question number one. So before we even start, let's talk about how we detect earthquakes and go over some vocabulary words. So some of the vocabulary words that we've talked about are the focus, which is the point within the earth where the earthquake starts and releases energy. So it's re inside the earth where the earthquake starts and where the energy starts to spread. The epicenter is a location on the surface directly above the focus. So the surface of the earth where we're standing, the epicenter is right above the focus on the surface of the earth where the earthquake started. A fault are fractures in the Earth's crust because of plate movement. So when an earthquake occurs, it can happen from a fault, like the San Andreas Fault in California, when plates move in a transform boundary. But it can also happen in convergent and divergent boundaries. Okay, so a seismograph is a device that we use to record the vibrations of the Earth's surface when an earthquake occurs. And it looks kind of like this. So there is a weight with a pen attached to it. When an earthquake happens, um, the seismograph, the device starts to shake. And since the ball is attached to a pen, it starts to create a drawing that we call a seismogram. This is the drawing that shows us the vibrations of the earthquake and that we can process later to get further information. So the thing about seismographs is they are located all over the world. This is our global seismographic network. So seismographs are instruments used to record the motion of the ground during an earthquake. And they are installed in the ground throughout the world, as you can see. So wherever we have an earthquake, we basically have a device or a seismograph there in a seismic station to detect and record that earthquake. <clears throat> Here's another picture. So say an earthquake happens, this is our focus. The epicenter is on the surface directly above the focus. This earthquake will release seismic waves. And remember, earthquakes create three types of waves, P waves, S waves, and L waves. We're mostly focusing on P waves and S waves because those are the ones that stay on the ground and go through the interior of the earth. So remember that P waves travel fastest. So you can see that the P waves are traveling very fast to our sensor, which is where our seismograph is. And then an S wave will arrive eventually. These sensors will have seismographs that we saw earlier that will record the drawings or the waves of that earthquake. And then the sensor will use um, electromagnetic waves to send that signal into an information to an earthquake alert center and to other information detection centers to process that earthquake. Okay, and this is kind of what a seismograph gram looks like, the drawing that a seismograph creates. And you can see that the first wave that it detects is a P wave because it's the fastest wave. The second wave that it detects is an S wave. And then the last wave that it detects are surface waves, which is which are L waves. Okay. So please open up page 11 of your reference table. And if you do, you'll see this graph <clears throat> called earthquake, P wave, and S wave travel time. So what it's showing you on the X axis is the epicenter distance, meaning the distance of the epicenter, the surface where the earthquake started, to the sensor where we're going to detect that earthquake wave. Okay, so it takes um, the P wave and S wave have to travel a certain distance to actually get to the sensor or the seismograph. And the Y axis shows the travel time, how long the P wave will take to take, go, get to the sensor and how long the S wave will take to get to the sensor from the epicenter or the focus. That's why we have a P wave curve, how long the P wave will take to travel that distance and how long the S wave will take to travel that distance. Okay, you should also notice that our x-axis, each little increment here is 200 kilometers. And one actually represents 1,000 kilometers times 10 to the third power, two represents 2,000, three represents 3,000, and so on. So this tiny line would be 200, 400, 600, 800, 1,000, and so on. Our y-axis it has increments of 20 seconds. It's showing us time in minutes. So here's one minute. Remember, one minute is 60 seconds. So if we count, this is 0, 20 seconds, 
40 seconds, 60 seconds is one minute. This is one minute, 20 seconds, one minute, 40 seconds, two minutes, two minutes, 20 seconds, two minutes, 40 seconds, three minutes, and so on. If you need to write pause and write this down on your reference table to remember, you can. Okay, so let's start with question number one. If you are asked the travel time of a P and S wave for a given epicenter distance, go to the epicenter distance on the x-axis and go over to the y-axis and determine the travel time. For example, example one, how long does it take a P wave to travel 4,000 kilometers? Let's try it. So here's my graph on my reference table, page 11. To figure out how long a P wave takes to travel 4,000 kilometers, we're given the distance. So here's my distance. I'm going to start at 4,000. 4 represents 4,000. To figure out how long a P wave takes to travel that distance, I'm just going to go up the 4. I stop at my P wave curve. I go towards the left, towards the x, sorry, the y axis, and I notice that it takes a P wave 7 minutes to travel that distance. So your answer is 7 minutes. Example 2. How long does it take an S wave to travel 4,000 kilometers? Now, um, because it says 4,000 kilometers, I'm going to start on my x-axis at 4. 4 represents 4,000. But this time I'm asked about my S wave. So I'm going to go all the way up to my S wave curve and go towards the left to my y-axis. And I see that it takes the S wave 12 minutes, 12 minutes, 20 seconds, 12 minutes, 40 seconds for the S wave to travel 4,000 kilometers. So my answer is 12 minutes, 40 seconds. So please pause the video to try examples 3 and 4. Okay, let's go over example 3. How long does it take for the P wave to travel 8,000 kilometers? Now we're given 8,000 kilometers. I'm given the distance, so I'm going to start at my x-axis. 8 represents 8,000. I'm going to go all the way up to my P wave curve because it's asking about my P wave. And then I'm going to go left to my y-axis, and I see that it takes the P wave 11 minutes, 20 seconds to travel 8,000 kilometers. For example 4, how long does it take an S wave to travel 8,000 kilometers? I'm going to start at 8. 8 represents 8,000, but this time I'm asked about my S wave, so I'm going to go all the way up to my S wave curve. I'm going to stop at the line, and I'm going to go left to my Y axis, and I see that it takes my S wave 20 minutes and 40 seconds. 20 minutes, 20 seconds, 20 minutes, and 40 seconds to travel 8,000 kilometers. Notice that the S wave takes significantly longer than the P wave to travel that same distance. Okay, that's it for now.